of cute, didn't see him before, and he, they start singing songs about him. They sing, Saul has killed his thousands. David's killed his tens of thousands. And Saul's like, you know what? That makes me mad. And he got really jealous. He said, I gotta kill this guy, I don't like him. He's coming from my throne, he's, he's getting all the attention. And so the king decided to try to kill David. We pick up the story in, in verse 15 and 16 of 1 Samuel 23. While David was at Horesh in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. It's a bad day. Verse 16, watch what happens. And Saul's son, his very own son, Jonathan, went to David at Horesh, and what did he do? Everybody say it aloud. What did he do? He helped him find strength in God. Say that again. What did he do? Everybody together. He what? He helped him find strength in God. Every single one of you, you need those friends who help you find spiritual strength. Because I don't care how mature you are, you will get tempted and you will get down. And when everyone else walks out, you need a friend that walks in and says, I'm with you. I'm not just gonna pray for you, but I'm gonna pray with you. I'm going to strengthen you in the things of the Lord. And I'm so thankful for an arsenal of friends who surround me and help me find strength in the Lord. In fact, it wasn't too long ago, I just had one of those unreasonably bad days. I don't know if you ever have these. It's like everything's fine, but suddenly nothing's fine. And I was physically just depleted from working too much. And uh, I felt like I wasn't making a difference. I preached my brains out and people just kind of like, uh, you know, and I just, I give it all I've got. And it's just, it just didn't seem to be making a difference. And I was taking some shots from different groups of people and I just was discouraged. And so I said to a close friend, I said, I don't know if it's worth it. I'm just, I'm just tired of it. I, I, just, I don't know if what I do is really making a difference. And my friend said, I can see why you feel that way. And then he shifted gears and he brought the preach and put it on me. He said, number one, the reason you're being attacked is because you're doing something right. Satan doesn't want that and you need to be blessed because to be persecuted for the sake of Christ is actually a great blessing. And number two, he said, you don't think you're making a difference? You're standing in my presence telling me that? He said, I would not be married today if it wasn't for you. He said, my son would not be serving the Lord if it wasn't for you. My daughter wouldn't be a leader at Switch if it wasn't for you. Two guys that I work with, one would still be on porn if it wasn't for you. The other guy would never be in church if it wasn't for you. And the waiter last night that I tried to invite to church said, oh, I already go to that church and I would be dead if it wasn't for Pastor Chris. Right? And so the next time you start feeling sorry for yourself, just remember God is using you. I was like, darn straight he is. Who has time to whine? Let's go change the world. And, and what happened is, I mean, in a moment of time, he, he, he built me up. And then he kept on going. And he started preaching to me scripture. He said, you remember when you're down. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God wants to do more through you than you can ask think or imagine what's happening now is just the beginning. So you encourage yourself in the Lord. And then he prayed for me and, and God built my strength. Do you have that? I'm not talking about, well, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I listened to the Christian song one time. You know, I got a cross chain somewhere from the 80s. You know, and I'm not talking about that, okay? I'm talking about someone who wakes up in the middle of the night with you on their heart and calls you the next day and says, I had you on my heart, so I prayed for you for about an hour and a half or so, and God gave me this scripture. I don't know what it means, but I wanna give it to you, and I'm here for you no matter what, and no matter what happens, you're not going down because we're in this together. Do you have those people who help you find spiritual strength? Because if you don't, you may be one friend away from changing the course of your destiny. And not only do you want those who do that for you, but oh, don't rob yourself of the blessing of doing that for others. That when you lift up others, not just a friend who has fun with their friends, but helps them get better at the things that matter most and helps them find spiritual strength in the things of God. If you ever wanna get excited anywhere in this message, it's totally fine with me because I think this is really helpful and good stuff and I love it when you're in there 
with me. We're gonna look for those friends that help us get better and find spiritual strength. And then finally, there's Nathan in the life of David, the third type, if you're taking notes. We need a friend who will tell us the truth. You all need that friend who will tell you the truth. And here's what happened to David. If you know, he was a man after God's own heart and God was blessing him. And then he took his eye off the Lord and he put his eye on Bathsheba. And he committed adultery, broke the heart of God and put the whole kingdom really at risk with this particular sin. And he didn't see the gravity of what he did. And God sent a man, Nathan, to go and tell him the truth. And Nathan sat him down and said, David, let me tell you a little story. Once upon a time, there was a really wealthy guy that had sheep and cattle more than you could count. And there was a really poor guy, dirt poor, who had one little lamb. This lamb was like a pet to him. They did life together. And one day, a traveler came and was hungry. And so the wealthy guy didn't use one of his own but took the poor guy's only lamb and slaughtered it to give to the traveler. And David's like, oh, that's the worst thing ever. This guy, he should be put down for that. That's the worst thing ever. And Nathan looked at David and in the Hebrew language, he said, ataish. Everybody say ataish. Ataish. He said, you are the man. That's what he said. You're the man. You did it. And he loved him enough to tell him the truth. And suddenly, David saw what he hadn't seen before, and he was broken hearted before God. You go read Psalm 51 sometime and watch as David repents. That's the prayer that he prayed right after Nathan confronted him and told him the truth. And I would ask you this, when is the last time you've had a friend who loved you enough to tell you, don't go there, that's stupid. What you're doing is not gonna work. You're gonna hurt your marriage. You're gonna hurt your testimony. You're gonna hurt your relationship with God. Hey, I see something in you that you don't see. You need to go for it. You need to have faith. You need to try. You need to apply for this. Someone will tell you the truth. I'm so thankful for those who will do this for me. In fact, um, for years, I had people kind of just gently say, hey, Craig, you're not real good one-on-one with people. Whenever you're one-on-one, and I'd be like, who are you and why am I listening to you? Of course I'm good with people. I'm, I'm great with people. I'm friendly. I'm nice. I'm friendly. And they say this over and over again. Well, finally, my life group just said, they, they came and kind of, it's like a confrontation. They said, Craig, we really love you. We want to help you. We know you're not doing this on purpose, but we want to show you what you do in the lobby. Okay? You're talking to someone in the lobby and they're in front of you and you stand like this. Like, yeah, what's wrong with that? And they said, why are you doing that? So I'm trying to tell them that I can't stay here forever because there are other people I've got to talk to. You can laugh if you want to. I didn't know. They're like, that's rude, okay? Sometimes when you're talking to people, you kind of like you're looking around. I said, yeah. They said, why do you do that? Because I'm trying to see how many other people I need to talk to, okay? They're like, that's rude again. And in order for me to do what I do with integrity, I cannot just preach in front of the crowds, but I must show the love of God effectively one-on-one, okay? And they helped me to do this. And now I feel like some of the most important things I'll do all week long is when I meet someone who's a part of our church and I wanna give them the very best of my attention and God's love. And now I have become better because someone loved me enough to tell the truth. Do you have that? Okay, if you don't, you may be one friend away from changing the course of your destiny. And let me just, if you'll give me permission to be a little dramatic for a moment, I wanna say this. Some of you, you will never become who God wants you to become because you are relationally impoverished, okay? If you continue with one or two close friends, realize that is not what God intended for you. He wants us to have Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 12, 15 communities of people who do life together, who, who pour into one another, who serve one another, who encourage one another, who bless one another, who give to one another, who exhort one another. And you may be a few friends away from changing the course of your destiny. You show me your friends, and I promise you, I can show you your future. For some of you, when I look at your friends, your future is new addictions that you do not have. Some of you, your future, you are heading toward a divorce that your friends are contributing to. 
Some of you, if I can just be so dramatic to say, your future could be jail because of your friends. Now, a lot of you are going, okay, okay, you had me, now you're getting a little dramatic there, Pastor Craig. Dial it back. Fair enough. For the majority of you, your friends aren't going to lead you to jail, but let me tell you what they are going to do. They're going to lead you to more of the same. And this isn't everybody, but for a lot of you, what is more of the same? It's a lukewarm, half-hearted commitment to God. It's a self-centered life that's all about you and accumulating things that will never satisfy. It's when the highlight of your life is going to a football game or a three-day weekend that you should know something is wrong, but you don't know there's anything wrong because that's all you see around you. But I came to tell someone, you may be one friend away from changing the course of your destiny. You may be one friend away from having the marriage that you've always wanted to have. You may be one friend away from becoming the parent that you know you could always be to impart spiritual life to generations to come for children who would fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with everything in them. You may be one friend away from being more generous than you've ever been, both with your finances and with your time. You may be one friend away from overcoming the addictions that have been in your family for years. You may be one friend away from learning how to better care for your temple of the Holy Spirit and add 10 years to the end of your life so you can watch your grandkids grow up. You may be one friend away from tapping into the power of what God is doing in this church and not just watching and consuming, but using your God-given gifts to serve someone else for his glory and for his kingdom. Say, you may be one friend away from waking up with divine purpose and living for a higher calling. And there are those of you who you may be one friend away from meeting the risen Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will become a friend that sticks closer than a brother and will introduce you to a holy God who will simultaneously be the king of kings and be a friend that you never dreamed possible. You could be one friend away.